Greetings, all. Um, thank you for joining us uh, again. Um, we're starting out 2021 strong uh, with the uh, University of Montana Outdoor Recreation Team and um, Columbia Falls. So we have a packed agenda with stunning, stunning guests. Um, our topic this, this time is called uh, Get to the Core. And um, we'll be reviewing the University of Montana's uh, Community Outdoor Recreation Realization Program for Rural Communities. Uh, next slide. Housekeeping. Uh, we will take your questions and comments through the chat. Um, we've got a, a back end, our back end um, map team member who's monitoring that. If you have trouble, you can text your issue to uh, 406-200-8240, or you can type in the chat box. Next slide. Uh, just a little bit about this series. Um, the co-hosts of this series are the Montana uh, Office of Outdoor Recreation and the uh, Montana Access Project. We, uh, in working together with the offices, we realized that we need to make content rich resources available in the time of COVID. So we've taken a lot of what we've done in person and uh, put it online. So what we try to do with this, this series is to have both uh, opportunities for resources coupled with under-recognized rural communities, very much tailored to leveling the playing field for all communities to have the kind of outdoor recreation access that they want for their community's future. Very community-based, very um, smaller, rural, underserved, under-recognized, community-based, and um, that's why what, that's what we're trying to do. Next slide. So the key takeaways for today are we're going to hear be introduced to the concept of core. Uh, we're going to go through the process a little bit uh, from both the um, U of M professors and students to review their studies and their recommendations for how communities can engage to address the challenges of funding, management, and sustainability, how CORE is part of that. Um, and then we'll kind of look at why it's important on the ground featuring a community like Columbia Falls, which will be the first pilot project for CORE. And we'll talk a little bit about next steps. Next slide. Our guests, Oh, God, I'd love to go in deeper, but um, let me just say these um, bios and our guests, our presentations all will are recorded and they will all be available. So if you want to go back and see the um, rock star resumes of our of our guests, um, you can do that. Um, maybe I'll have them introduce themselves a little bit um, during the presentation. So we have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Metcalf and Dr. Jen Thompson, who are both associate professors in, um, well, Libby is a associate professor in uh, recreation natural resource management. And uh, Dr. Jen Thompson is an associate professor in parks, tourism and recreation, both with the Frankie College of Forestry. We have Rachel Schaus, who is a recent U of M grad uh, that's working in the parks and outdoor recreation uh, space and helped tremendously with SCORP, which we'll talk about a little bit, SCORP. Remember that. Uh, next slide. Uh, Riley Ritchie wasn't able to join us today, but Patrick Valentine is with us, a student who is um, studying parks, tourism, recreation management at the University of Montana. Um, he was instrumental in putting together this report um, and doing the research for this report that we'll hear about. And finally, we have Sammy Johnson, who's a Montana native and Columbia Falls um, business owner, who will talk a little bit about why a process like CORE in a town like Columbia Falls can help move the needle on outdoor recreation, which is essential both for personal wellness, health, wellness, and um, economic vitality. Next slide. 
I do this every time. I continue to do it every time because this is what it's all about and this is why we're all here. So the value of recreation is, is really threefold. You have economic vitality benefits that overlap with quality of life benefits and health and wellness benefits. Um, outdoor rec is, is right at the center and shares aspects of, of all of those things. It's really important and probably even more important now that um, being outdoors in nature is really one of the only ways that we can uh, maintain our sanity and our health and socialize. Next slide. So to drill down on the economic piece, um, it's a huge economic driver in our nation. It's 2.1% of the GDP, 400, about $460 billion is spent on outdoor recreation. It's 4.7% of Montana's $53 billion GDP. And we are third place in the nation behind Hawaii and Vermont as to how important outdoor recreation, both access, places, infrastructure, gear, tourism is um, to the economy. Next slide. Health and wellness. Ample studies that show being outside in natural surroundings in nature is, is incredibly important for health and wellness, for mental health, for physical health. Um, physical activity in nature, studies have shown is uh, more beneficial than working out in the gym, although working out at the gym is okay too. Um, place very instrumental for children's health, trying to deal with the obesity and uh, mental health of children, especially now. Outdoor recreation, it provides us places to meet and socialize. I know I do and call people and ask them to meet at the trailhead instead of at the, at the brewery or wherever, which is probably a bummer for my, my friends and colleagues who own um, restaurants, but it's, um, it's what I need to do to stay healthy. And, and really it just benefits everyone. I mean, the being outside in nature, whether you're, you're hardcore or medium core or whatever core, um, it really benefits and it just happens. Being in nature just makes us healthier and, and more well. Next slide. Finally, that third leg of the stool is quality of life. Um, in our, one of our prior episodes, um, we had a great presentation by um, the Montana High Tech Alliance, Business Alliance and Business for Montana Outdoors. Their studies have shown that the number one re reason tech leaders give for doing business in Montana is quality of life. And a big part of the quality of life is, aside from schools and broadband, and safe communities is easy access to public lands. In Maine, um, they defined quality of life as livable communities, stunning scenery, and great recreational opportunities. So whatever Maine has, we have it times 10, right? Um, and finally in that, uh, I learned in that episode that there's research that shows that, that we're actually, there's this trend now called a brain gain instead of a brain drain. And they're finding that people in their 30s and 40s are coming back home to Montana and places like Montana to rural communities um, for quality of life, safety and security. They can afford housing, the outdoor recreation and quality schools. So, um, you know, that's an overlap a bit with economics, but, um, but that's, that's what's happening. Uh, next slide. So how do we how do we put that how do we get that going how do we put it to work and how do we put it to work on the ground? Well, luckily we have a statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan which uh, was actually uh, prepared in con for Montana state parks, um, which I think the UM team will talk about a little bit. But what it does is it provides a roadmap for recreation priorities over the next few years. Um, core, which we'll hear about, is just a really important strong tool that's available for smaller communities, especially those that don't have a parks and rec department, they don't have a dedicated funding source, open space bond, they don't have city and county 
resources, their capacity is super limited, yet they have amazing outdoor recreation amenities and a real desire to improve outdoor recreation for all the reasons that we just talked about, economics, quality of life, and health and wellness. Um, so I am going to, uh, let me see what the next slide is. Um, okay, uh, next slide, please. So what that looks like uh, in Columbia Falls and why we're looking at Columbia Falls as a pilot project is I'm gonna run this through this super quick and then we'll come back to it at the at, uh, later in the presentation. But like, if you look at a community like Columbia Falls and for those of you who don't know, Columbia Falls is, is the gateway to Glacier. Um, it's, uh, out, it's on the Flathead River system and uh, in Northwest Montana. So the community came up with this very large scale vision. Um, I'm sorry, this you can't see it uh, real well on this slide, but it, it contains about six different components for um, outdoor recreation infrastructure, creating a trail from Columbia Falls up to West Glacier, creating mountain bike, natural mountain biking trails in um, on Forest Service lands in uh, on a very large scale. And also down to the smaller scale of creating um, a, a local city park. Um, next slide. So if you drill down on it, oh, that component, here's a map of the Crystal Cedar project, which is a forest service project located in um, the uh, wildland urban interface. And um, it just is a community driven project with the Forest Service that combines vegetation management with um, outdoor recreation. Next slide. And at the very local level, you even have, you know, one of the components is this uh, park, which is the River's Edge, um, River's Edge City Park. Um, this this is just a little figure that is the concept the concept plan for that park, but the point that I want to show here is that there are all these pieces and parts that are happening, each of which is important. But um, looking at that bigger picture and starting to tick off those those uh, project by project, I mean that's what happens in smaller rural communities because I mean we don't there's never enough money, never enough capacity, and never enough you know, time to get everything done at once. So um, with that, we'll set the stage for why CORE and a pro program like CORE is really important for a community like Columbia Falls that's got some stuff going on, but obviously outdoor recreation access and quality access is super critical to their future. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the UM team. Thank you, Diane. And hi, all. My name is Libby Metcalf, and uh, I get to introduce this concept of CORE, and um, I'll, our subsequent team will kind of introduce themselves as they go. Like Diane said, I'm a professor at the University of Montana, and um, I've been thinking a lot about outdoor recreation over the last couple decades, and especially in the state of Montana. And so we're excited to have um, to feature CORE today. Um, uh, as Diane said, we're drawing on Montana's rich natural resource-based economy that draws in people from all over the world, um, all over the country, all over our state. And we're trying to figure out how do we package um, planning efforts to uh, understand the variety and the spectrum of different outdoor recreation needs based on the different communities. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Next slide. Sorry. Thanks, Diane. Yeah. I'm going to be horrible at this slide. Uh, that's like, yeah. <laughs> and I don't have control over the slides. I think that's my issue. Um, uh, so CORE um, is Community Outdoor Recreation Realization. And it's, our, it's the pathway to realize your community's outdoor recreation potential. We started looking around the state of Montana and we realized that there are a lot of developed communities like Bozeman or where I'm situated in Missoula that have um, a strong population to pull from, that have a lot of resources coming into those communities. But what about other communities across the state that might not have a bond or uh, the tax base or the financial resources to create the outdoor recreation opportunities that that community in particular might want? And so we started looking at planning frameworks around the US and uh, assessing 
if those planning tools were appropriate for a place like Montana. And what we came back to thinking was that it, they didn't really fit. It didn't really fit the spectrum that we have in this state. And so we set out to try to understand how to develop a planning tool that fit the needs of Montana residents and Montana communities um, and having it be uh, easy to implement, um, free and um, available to anyone who wants it. And so CORE is the start of that process. To kind of take a step back, um, this, this idea of CORE came about when um, I met with Joe Alexander, who is with the Region 1 of the Forest Service, and he's their, uh, he's their heritage and trails uh, uh, leader. And he said that uh, something that was really profound. He said, you know, we have all this money going into rural development through the USDA, and we just haven't quite figured out how to get that money towards outdoor recreation. And, he's, and his idea was, let's, let's figure out a planning tool. And he equated it with the community wildfire planning process that happens in across the Western US. And he said, what if we created a, a, a community planning tool that was really easy to use? Um, and so with the help of Joe and with Rachel Schmidt, uh, formerly at the Office of Outdoor Recreation and Diane, and then of course our University of Montana team, we started to come up with a pr preliminary process to kind of chart the future path of outdoor recreation potential in the state of Montana. And so that's what CORE is really about. Um, next slide, please. So um, our goals on this CORE process is to provide guidance to communities throughout Montana to support the planning, vision, and implementation of outdoor recreation. We're concerned with community well-being but we're also concerned with the outdoor recreation economy. We recognize that not every community uh, wants to necessarily have a lot of tourists or they don't necessarily want to capitalize on the tourism dollar. And so we wanted to design a process that was inclusive of those communities that did want that tourism dollar, but also those communities that just wanted to enhance the well-being of their particular community. And so that's what CORE is really all about. Um, I'm going to mention a few quick things before I advance us to the next slide. Um, and get into some of the details. And the first one is the one that Diane talked about, which is the SCORP plan. And so anyone who has me talk in the state of Montana, this is usually what I'm talking about is SCORP, the State Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan. And I worked with um, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, um, in particular state parks on creating this plan. And what it does is it, it's, a, it's a roadmap to how we should plan for outdoor rec in the next five years. And so one of the first things we do um, in any type of planning effort is to acknowledge some of those, those guideposts that are out there that help us kind of achieve those outdoor recreation goals. And so I see the core process dovetailing very closely with some of the initiatives that are in this SCORP plan. And I'm always happy to talk to communities about SCORP and how they can use SCORP in their own planning. Um, for the future. But I just want to acknowledge that this plan is out there. Um, I have stacks of them on my, my shelf behind me. The second thing I want to note is that um, uh, we have been working on, on CORE for uh, about uh, six months or so. And one of the critical components um, that Dr. Thompson will talk about is kind of how do you, how do we Montana get our students involved. And so we're very fortunate today to have Patrick on the call, um, who's been a student who's been working on the core process with us for the past three months. Um, he's also going to be a graduating senior. And so I'll put a plug in for Pat's looking for jobs. Um, and, <laughs> and he's amazing when you hear him talk. Um, and so um, we have been using our student base to help us prep and plan for this core process. And it's been uh, pretty incredible to see um, uh, our students kind of engage in this. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so let's go back to core. So we know we want to develop this planning process, and we're going to talk about what that planning process actually looks like right now. But before we get there, I want to talk about why or who core is actually for. We don't see, um, we see core being for anyone. It could be for a federal group, it could be for a state, it could be for a local community, it can be for collaborative teams that are looking to um, develop outdoor recreation resources at a landscape level. In the case of today, we're going to talk pretty intimately about Columbia Falls, and so that's a particular community, but we know that Columbia Falls is, is, has some partners um, outside of the, the confines of that community. And so we see CORE as being able to flex and uh, change depending on whatever population or whatever group we uh, want to use it. 
And so the core process is really for everybody. And we're, we're really tailoring these first uh, round of core for communities in Montana. And so one of the things that we're trying to, we're going to be doing with CORE is we're going to actually pilot this program with uh, several communities across the state. And our very first community that we're going to pilot it with is going to be Columbia Falls. And we're really excited about that partnership to try to try it out. So what does CORE actually look like? Well, like we said, it's a planning document. Um, and at, uh, next slide, please. And what we have done is outline um, several steps of CORE. And we're going to take you through each of those steps so you can see what we're thinking and how we're going to conceptualize those things together. And so for the, uh, the next part of this presentation, we're going to go round robbing through those steps and talk about um, why we think these steps are important and what they actually mean. And then we'll come back and close it all up at the end and then hear from Sammy from uh, Columbia Falls and, and get her perspective on it all. And so with that, I'm going, we're going to step through these steps um, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Rachel Schaus, who's going to start with some of the goals and objectives around um, these steps and, and really get, dive into number one, which is community engagement. And so Rachel, you're up. I don't know if you want to quickly introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Schaus. Um, so diving into step one, which is community, community engagement. This is the process of identifying stakeholders, identifying your community's needs and determining your community's key values. Um, stakeholders may range from residents, community decision makers, community groups, local parks and rec departments, NGOs, land trusts, and more. Um, it should be emphasized this step is meant to be very broad and very inclusive and all interests should be represented and the right people need to be in the room. Moving to step two is the formation of a coordinating team. This team should be representative of the different community interests and perspectives that were identified in step one. Um, the coordinating team will serve as the working group and will be charged with implementing the core process. Moving to step three is developing a shared vision. The shared vision is the opportunity to envision where your community wants to go and what your community sees for the future. This should be a clear and concise statement reflecting your community's values, goals, and the overarching, overarching vision for the future. Um, this may seem, seem simple, but um, it will take significant time and a lot of effort. Um, but CORE will ideally provide the tools and techniques to help communities reach this shared vision. And it should also be noted that this vision will look very different for every community and that's okay. Um, one community may have a vision of developing their local recreation assets to just improve the quality of life for their residents, um, while another may have a vision of developing their outdoor recreation economy. Um, it's very dependent upon uh, the individual community and that's, that's encouraged. And with that, I'll pass it over to Jen. Hi everybody, um, Jen Thompson, and um, I've, I was working with the student group, um, kind of diving into a lot of these steps, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, I'm going to take us to step four, which is recreation asset mapping, and this is a really key step, um, because while it may seem simple, again, there's lots of different types of assets, and they may be some that are within your community, like the boundaries of your community, and some may be beyond, so for instance, for Columbia Falls, some of their assets is being close to Glacier National Park, even though that's not necessarily within the confines of their community. And so really thinking about um, the scale of your assets, but also the, the different types. Some of them may be physical assets like land, resources, recreation areas. Others may be economic and like um, outfitters and different um, local businesses and, and um, gear suppliers. And so there's different ways of mapping that out. And some may be very simple as far as mapping it out literally with people drawing on pieces of paper um, or itemizing your, your list. Um, and others may be much more um, in depth of really creating layers um, of maps and different assets. And so with each of these steps, there's various ways that you can keep it pretty simple and much more complex or in depth depending on what that shared vision is. So once you have mapped out what your community has as far as assets, um, the next step is information gathering. And what we mean by this is that we want the community to develop a deep understanding of the vision, which again is step three, but then how do you look at what you currently have 
And what do we need to know about that in order to move forward with our vision and, and, uh, and that realization? And so this may be involving, you know, getting feedback um, from, you know, the market that you may be trying to attract or even just um, participants in the community. It could be looking at um, gathering information on where you're trying to do your plans, like such as building a trail or infrastructure. Um, so there's lots of different types of information that can be gathered, but it's also important to recognize that there's a lot of information out there that has been gathered. So going back to your steps one and two about being inclusive and representative in this process, um, having those relationships in place can be really important in, in sharing information. So you're not having group um, any aspects of that, and but you can use that information in a meaningful um, way just to help you move forward in the process. And then when you um, have gathered the necessary information, um, we move to step six, which is identifying opportunities. So again, you know, going back to that shared vision, what are, if you had to, you know, develop as a team, a list of opportunities to help you meet that vision, um, you know, kind of identifying those and putting them all out on the table. But then we, we recommend um, conducting a SWOT analysis. And SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's a very common tool used in any, um, in lots of different forms of planning, but can be used in this in, in, in looking at opportunities. So as an example, let's say your community wants to build a trail um, and, you know, that um, moves, you know, through the community and connects to the, to the neighboring, um, you know, public lands. And so that can be your opportunity, but then looking at how are we going to actually do this and what do we have in place? So the opportunities or the strengths for that could be that, you know, you have national forest right next to your community um, and, and a great resource to actually put the trail in place. Um, a weakness may be that you need to get access to this land um, and then also need to physically build the trail because it's not currently um, mapped out and you know, not having that infrastructure. Um, some of the opportunity though may be that if your community can achieve this, it, it provides connectivity with neighboring public lands or even to other communities. Um, again, feeding back into your, your shared vision. And then, you know, thinking about even some threats and some, you know, um, other challenges that may come across, such as like, how are we going to maintain this? How do we actually build it? And things like that. So the point of this step is to really put out all your options on the table, but then also try and assess what are the strengths, weaknesses to actually moving this forward so that you can make, um, you know, uh, uh, decisions based on that. So with that, I will turn it over to Pat, who's going to take us to, to step seven. Hey guys, so uh, yeah, my name is Patrick Valentine, and I was a, I'm a senior here, and I worked with Jen on this project, and actually everyone else in this panel as well a little bit. So uh, I'm going to start off with step seven here. So this is our um, determining our priorities for action. Um, and in this, process by kind of making use of that SWOT analysis that Jen just told us about. Uh, we were able to get kind of to a point in this process where our opportunities can finally be prioritized. And in this step, you'll be working with, uh, you know, that coordinating team that Rachel mentioned back in step two. Um, you'll be working with this team to identify your priorities and just how important each one is uh, in the order of your overall process. In this step, you'll also identify um, a list of different priorities you have, and these may be uh, short-term priorities, they may be long-term, and they also could be these, we call them kind of your middle of the road priorities. Um, in this step, it's important that uh, to be able to identify which of these priorities will help you get closer to your overall goal and which ones can kind of be focused on at a later time. Um, and you know, while it is important to focus on your overall goal, um, it's also really important to remember that these priorities you know, they're not always huge. Uh, they can be both big and small. You know, it, it feels really good to be out on the ground, you know, moving dirt and putting in trails and actually working. But um, sometimes the most successful step you can take is something a bit smaller, such as making sure that your community has access to that recreation map that Jen told us about in step four. This kind of gets them involved a little more and kind of streamlines the process. Um, so next, well, I'm gonna talk about step eight which is our final step. And this is our, this is our take action step. Um, after all these previous steps have been completed, um, a quick kind of a foundation has been laid. This final step involves preparing this action plan for uh, implementation. This uh, for obvious reasons is a huge step because finally after all your planning and prep um, that you and your team have done, you're beginning the process of, of, of making things happen. 
preparing for this implement for the implementation of your plan includes things such as ensuring that funding, uh, training, staffing, and resources are available to initiate and implement the action. Uh, in addition, taking action includes kind of continued monitoring and adjustment of management actions based on your monitoring efforts. It's not a this isn't a really cut and dry process. You know, it's fluid and it's based on um, every community is different, and every every step of the process will be different based on where you're where you're uh, where it's happening at. Um, it's important to outline specific steps to move ahead with these priority for action as well, and also to stress that this process is directly between you and your stakeholders. Rachel kind of mentioned that a little bit. Um, these are people that have both. Uh, the most to gain and also to lose in your process. So it is, it's absolutely critical that they're pretty much with you every step of the way. Um, as part of CORE, we will work with the, you know, these project partners and professionals to help us assist in developing um, this parallel document to help specifically with this final step too. Um, and that's kind of what I had for step eight and Diane has some more that she's gonna follow up with on that. Um, thank you. Oh, I just love hearing about this. Um, it's, uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, so my um, my background and expertise and, and really um, what I've been able to uh, bring to this project is on the implementation side. And as the um, in my experience with the Whitefish Trail and in my experience with other smaller communities, um, the the implementation is very particular to what to your goals. There's some commonality, uh, but there's some uh, there's some differences. And I think part of what um, I think part of what I think this process will do in this core process that I that I've kind of hammered home on on all my team members is. Um, you know, you get your plan and it has an implementation strategy, but how you can take action, who you can turn to, how you find experts that are, that understand what it's like to live in a rural community, um, that understand that um, there is no planning department, there is no, maybe, you know, or maybe minimal, or maybe they've got their hands full with the parks that, that they already have, or the basketball court or the swimming pool. So I think um, one of the things that excites me about this, this process is that um, we intend to continue to provide plugins with coaching, um, toolkits, but as I explain it, it's toolkits plus, because I'm going to tell you, I used every toolkit in the book to um, uh, when we were planning and developing the Whitefish Trail. And, you know, you get to a point where you say, what do I do now? Or that didn't work. Or no, that won't work for me. Or that sounds nice, but that ain't happening in my community. So, um, you know, having being able, having the ability to couple other communities that maybe have had the same challenges that you have, maybe a little bit different, but you know, how their, their problems, how they were able to implement their problem solving, um, I think is going to be one of the super cool um, aspects of this core process that's going to really help move the needle on the ground. Um, let's see, what do you, um, do, can we move on or do you need more from me on that? No, that was, that was beautiful. Although you did have a slide, Diane, did you forget to advance your slide? Oh, I, oh yeah, I did. Yeah. Oh. Um, next slide, Andy. <laughs> um, it, but actually before we, we move on to this, I do want to, um, I do want to say that, um, well, I'll wait till the end. Go ahead. Uh, Rachel, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, I think so, I'm actually starting. Oh this. yeah, go ahead, oh, Jen. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Rachel. Um, so I just wanted to briefly share a little bit more about what, um, the students worked on this past semester and that they, they did a, um, really, you know, 
great work and not only looking at other frameworks as far as um, planning for recreation, like Libby had mentioned earlier, um, but then, you know, helping us um, have these discussions on the key steps. And then another big aspect that they really helped with was we identified, I believe it was eight different um, potential pilot communities throughout the state of Montana and basically went and created these um, background information and, and on their recreation, key contacts, all of these almost like profiles for each of them. And we were trying to choose a diversity of places throughout the state, not just ones that um, you know, have more what we think of as a recreation economy, um, but other ones that are um, you know, even tribal communities, very rural communities, ones that are in different geographic um, areas of the state have different types of assets um, so that we can really make sure that when we're piloting that we're able to um, try out this um, you know, framework on various communities so that we can refine it and really learn what's gonna make it work and what, what doesn't work. And so um, even though today we're all obviously talking about Columbia Falls as our future pilot community, I just want to again reiterate that we have lots of other ones and the students put in great work um, to put those profiles together. So I think I'll turn it over to Libby um, to help us talk about where we're at now um, with, with um, this process and um, how this is going into our next steps. Thanks, Jen, and th thanks all for uh, sitting through us with this. Um, yeah, we're really excited. We It took us a little bit, um, you know, for all the typical reasons, COVID, pandemic, everything else, to get to this point. We were hoping to be here a lot sooner. Um, but we're excited to start actually testing these steps and uh, experimenting with these steps in an actual community. And so we're, our next kind of phase is to pilot the core planning process in Columbia Falls. Um, we have a series of, I believe, six communities that we're hoping to do this with. And this is where kind of the research arm of the institution of UM, um, it, that's what we kind of get excited about is actually piloting things um, and trying stuff out and refining and making it better. And so um, we, we're gonna start doing that pilot process hopefully the summer of next year, um, or I guess that's this year, so summer of 2021. Uh, I wanna let folks know that we have Rachel's contact information here. She works with us very closely and she can provide you the slides that we have. We also have a four plate pager on CORE that we can send to you. And we're also, if you guys are interested in CORE and you're interested in actually piloting this in your own places, you can get in touch with us as well. Um, we are very in a very fortunate spot where we, we are going to, Jen, Rachel, and myself are going to be working intimately with communities to help this along, which is kind of cool. Um, Jen and I both have uh, years and years of experience of working with uh, local communities on rural development and around outdoor recreation. So it's kind of a, a fun process for us to actually get our, our hands dirty a little bit and to, and to work with folks on the ground that actually are thinking about outdoor recreation in a more deep and meaningful way. The other thing I wanna say is that um, uh, I'm gonna plug SCORP once again. And the reason for that is um, we have to do these state comprehensive outdoor recreation plans. And these plans are often tied with money for land and water conservation funds. There's a whole grants process that goes along with SCORP that your community or your organization might be eligible for. And so Rachel and I uh, know all about this and can help put you in the right place. And, um, and what's really neat about SCORP is there's a lot of uh, stories in there. There's a lot of examples. There's a lot of kind of key objectives that your community can start using uh, to plan for outdoor recreation. And so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Diane, who's going to introduce Sammy. Uh, uh, we have one more slide. Oh, Next God. slide. Darn it. <laughs> So, um, so the, the question about um, what's next, um, one, one also, in addition to um, developing the framework and the pilot projects, um, we are working with the Office of Outdoor Recreation, Montana Access Project, and the university to um, develop a digital uh, multimedia portal for recreation innovation. And we, this is our ninth, um, webinar and like I said I every time if I watch uh, old you know former ones I still learn things so um, we'll have information and digital assets from both the uh, summits of outdoor recreation that happened through the Montana um, the uh, Montana Office of Outdoor Recreation we'll have these webinars and we'll also be compiling um, digital 
assets and resources for communities to learn about each other and learn from experts who have been able to do and accomplish things that folks might want to do. Um, it, it, we don't have anything like that in Montana, so it really helps implement SCORP. In my mind, it makes it, it's a very exciting because it starts um, gathering information and creating community around um, outdoor recreation, particularly in rural communities. And next, and, and also in, uh, you know, well, I say 2021, it should be 2021. Um, we're looking at an inspired recreation masterclass series um, in conjunction with the university and basically will do in-depth um, interactive outdoor recreation focused workshops in the areas that folks need help with and get past they when they hit the do uh, I've done that now what um, we'll come we'll pair um, communities and experts and have these interactive series around the kind of issues that people get stuck on um, on uh, memory you know agreements working with local government working with private government working on private lands um, how to develop diverse and, and equity based projects in your communities, um, how to build in sustainability. So we're um, really excited about that. Um, if you want to stay up to date, you can send Libby an email. You can also um, join a Facebook group, Montana Access Project. Uh, I put in the chat, we also have a, a private Facebook group called Fr uh, Front Country Recreation Alliance. We'll keep you posted on updates for resources like this, but also we'll let you know what's happening with outdoor recreation, um, key outdoor recreation legislation in the in the uh, legislature this year, which is in session right now. Um, and next next slide. All right, now I'm going to turn to Columbia Falls. Um, it is the gateway to Glacier, as you can see those those peaks in the background and Columbia Falls in the foreground. Next slide. I'm going to go super quick. So um, Jen, Jen and Libby both talked about, you know, this ecosystem of a community like Columbia Falls. And I just did a quick little spitball here um, of, of assets um, that we have Glacier National Park, you have federal agencies you have state agencies, you've got trail projects that are ongoing, which are in the purple, Columbia Falls River Trail, the City Park, Bad Rock Canyon, Cedar Flats Trails. You've got really important, um, you know, business allies, both directly with communities and like, like businesses, like guiding businesses, like Larry's Fly Shop. You've got, um, wood related wood fiber related uh, timber pro businesses like Stoltz landed lumber you've got smart lamb you've got um, you know wood related um, industries you've got Glencore you've got large landowners industrial landowners and you have um, in the orange you have these nonprofit and uh, economic development groups that make it all happen. This is not comprehensive, so don't email me and say, you left out so-and-so, because I left out a zillion. But, but what CORE can help do is take that, that map, that ecosystem map, and start connecting both resources and on the ground, trails, parks and trails. Next slide. So now we'll turn to, um, to Sammy, who will talk about why a pro process like this is important and knowing just kind of coming from the perspective of living in in C Columbia Falls, choosing Columbia Falls over an other communities, um, both for her family and for her business, and why having a robust plan and addressing you know, more than in a little, the piecemeal is fabulous, but you know, how you, you grow and sustain those projects is, is super important. So I'll turn it over to you, Sammy. Hi, thank you, Diane and everyone on this panel. And, and uh, it's so lovely to be in this group and learn about 
what framework you've been working on tirelessly, it sounds like. And from my perspective, it's just such such a cool thing to see what you're doing. And anecdotally, as a business owner now, but also a Montana native, I think that my journey with outdoor recreation and, and observance of several different ways how it could be done is is really telling to what you're trying to say that like one size does not fit all on you know making outdoor recreation accessible or even a possibility for some of these really small towns so backing up a bit i'm from montana and from a very small town called white sulfur springs which is on the east side of the mountains um, very much a ranching community and that's where i grew up um, 2,500 head of cows, so lots of time spent chasing cows, branding, but also lots of time on the ski hill, riding a little double chairlift and, and doing all the things you do in a little town. So that experience growing up, you don't even, you don't even know what you have until you leave. And I went to college in the big city of Missoula and um, on the west side way less wind and way more people and actually got a, you know, a forestry degree in, in the tourism department and also a business degree. But in Missoula, I was really, my eyes were open in lots of ways, but the way that I was able to connect with that community in a way that I had never done before was via the trails. Um, the access to trails from Missoula, from my front door or from campus was unrivaled in my previous life. That just wasn't something I was able to do or feel and in growing up in White Silver Springs or even thought was possible. So I got to know the community via my own two feet. And so also I delivered pizza. So I was able to drive in parallel park. But anyway, the aspect of running from town in five different directions, not only is a poor college student, that's the cheapest way of mental health and clarity that and mental fitness, quite frankly, going through college, it has stuck with me through my whole career. And Having graduated from the University of Montana, my husband and I moved up north and now in 2005 and live in the Flathead Valley and, and still had that like need to connect with the outdoors some way, shape or form as I was starting my professional career. And um, I started working in the outdoor industry in a public relations firm where authentically we were very much in the mountains. Yet as I was living and you know bought our first home in Columbia Falls, it became obvious on how hard it was to piece together open space to run to cross-country ski to hunt to fish whatever um there were lots of people like me in missoula and they're all here yet i felt very far away from how to access any sort of organized trail system with the mountains being literally out our back door so in the time that i've lived here that's changed dramatically and continues to be shaped even more as you've seen you know, with this talk right now. And, and uh, even within the Flathead Valley, the diversity of the communities, as Diane mentioned, the, the legacy partners and whitefish versus what's happening in Columbia Falls, like there's a pretty polar differences of communities and value systems. And I think what you guys are um, saying here is just so obvious that not everybody and not every community can do all the things that is required to have a trail system that's emblematic of Missoula, nor is it appropriate. So um, in the short amount of time, a lot of work's been done and now I can run all sorts of places here and I'm so eternally grateful. And now as I've transitioned to a couple of different professions here in the Valley, whether, um, you know, marketing agency where the outdoors um, it, at a local news organization with the Flathead Beacon. I mean, we started an outdoor running club and we met after work twice a week and just ran in all through the winter, summer trails, streets. And so like that sense of community and bonding. Um, when I, I started a nature inspired daycare and now in my current career, it's very much, um, I'm a I'm a business owner. We're, we're technically based in Whitefish, but I, I still live over in Columbia Falls, but my business partner and I were manufacturing sales reps. So I work in the construction and um, building industry now. And um, whether it's on two feet or two wheels, that's very much where we make a lot of our decisions. That mental clarity that we get and glean from working hard in the outdoors allows us to work hard every single day at our jobs. And I know there's so many hardworking people here who just need that quick noon walk or they need that 6 a.m. skin up the mountain or they just need to take their kids outside on a gray rainy November day. I mean, 
as we started having children, I have three children now, and um, having that connection to the outdoors um, was so important through every season of my life. As um, one thing I didn't mention, we moved up here in the Flathead Valley to work and live in Glacier Park. Um, I was a boat captain in, in Glacier Park where my husband still now works for the same company. So the seasons of my life, whether it's chasing cows or climbing peaks or chasing babies down slides to now where I'm running on trails and, and skiing with my children, it all has this common thread of like this outdoor access with communities that have mountains tall and small and water and rivers everywhere is just so vital to how it's shaped my life and how it can it will always continue to make me have decisions based around this quality of life that we can provide it's a, an immense value in my personal and, and professional life as i think i've hopefully portrayed today and that you know i'm not very involved in the community of columbia falls and the work it's taken to do for example the gateway to glacier but from an outsider's perspective it's purely magic like i just cannot believe the work that has been done and, and so eternally grateful and i just think that lots of communities can really benefit from just the slightest effort, whatever way, shape, or form that can be. So it's super nice to see this framework and vernacular that you're giving communities like Columbia Falls and repeat a hundred times, thousands of times over this state, over this region, that um, will instance, instantly see benefits. So, um, and in a final note, like I grew up a cowgirl and I'm not a cowgirl now, but you know what? Those cowboys and me who's trail running and training for marathons all have this need to connect outside, whatever way it looks like. And now in my business, I think it's just so interesting. I, I, the last point here, I'm a business partner with the, uh, in Sam Brown Company, but I'm also a partner in a new mass timber manufacturing facility in, in joint venture with FH Stoltz Land and Lumber, who is an immense, steward to the land and a great community partner. And Mass Timber is also one of those places where, you know what, everybody, the loggers and the trail runners and the people building homes and the people who care about the environment actually all care about the same thing. So this importance of outdoor recreation and this importance of having like a, a clean, healthy environment and in an environment where we're biophilic design, we've got using wood and it's helping our environment. like. We're all on the same side, whether any silo we may have come or sort of stereotype from east side of the mountains to a pizza delivery girl in Missoula to now um, raising my family in the flathead and in the in the backyard of Glacier National Park, like all of us have this common need and thread. So I feel like I'm going over time. I'm just going to stop there. And if I'm ever hiring, uh, just know that I, I will be hiring and it's, it's always important to know that outdoor and the fresh air is exactly where we make all of our important decisions, so. Thank you, Sammy. Um, that's great. I have a, a ton of questions for, um, for everyone, but um, I am going to share, uh, I'm gonna, is that, is it, is that some, oh, there you go, okay. Um, so, in closing, I want to go through um, what we have coming up, but but one thing I, I do want to mention that's kind of exciting. Sammy talked about it um, being this process being adaptable to other communities. Um, and Libby, uh, Libby also mentioned that um, Joe Alexander with the Forest Service was looking at the community wildfire protection planning process. And I think one of the strengths of that process is that it's um, a DIY. Um, you, you will have a better, more robust plan, of course, if you have more people working on it with you that can um, bring their expertise. But um, nothing stops a community from um, developing its, its own plan. And I think that's part of the exciting part of um, what uh, Jen is, is, has talked about and what Libby has talked about, about why this kind of tool is so important. We have looked at other, during this series, we've looked at a couple of other um, planning processes. There's one going on um, in, in, um, in Thompson Falls right now, that's a joint, joint uh, production of EPA, which is Environmental Protection and USDA. 
We've seen a process with MEDA, which is um, the Montana out, um, Environmental Development, excuse me, Montana Economic um, Development Association, and that was out of Shoto. We've seen a process that Lincoln went through with um, called Envision Lincoln, and that was part of the Main Street Montana Economic Development um, process. Um, we've we heard from Libby Montana, who had a variety of um, planning processes, both economic development and trails and recreation. Um, I think we have Tina Oliphant on the on the line here, who's an outdoor recreation champion. Um, so there's no one way to get to the top of the mountain, but um, but one of the I think one of the strong suits of this process is that. For example, with the EPA process that Thompson Falls participated in, I think there were 170 applicants nationwide and 10 were chosen to participate in the program. Um, similarly, I think in the, in the other programs, you know, where they bring the resources to you and the experts to you, um, they're fairly competitive and um, not, and if you don't get in, there aren't a lot of resources for you in your community, and that's part of the uh, part of what makes me excited about developing this this process. And I think it's part of what will help the land managers as well, like the Forest Service. Um, next slide. All right, so we have just a few minutes left. I just want to remind people that the application period is still open for RTP. I think they just did a um, video presentation. Uh, it may be available online if you want. I, I'll, I'll try to see if there's a link to it and put it on the Facebook group um, as to uh, how to, the nuts and bolts of how to apply for those grants. Um, our upcoming webinars, we have one scheduled on February 9th. Um, we will have Trust for Public Lands, um, David Weinstein, We'll talk about the how parks and recreation did at the ballot box in 2020, which is super interesting. Um, you know, state and local funding measures, in addition to federal funding measures, um, actually did pretty well. Um, we're hearing a lot about the elections, but we're not hearing a lot about those measures, and and they're pretty successful. People are really willing to open their wallets a bit for um, for good um, recreation out and and land protection. And we'll hear from the Bitterroot Land Trust about how they have local leveraged their local dollars for, for more access. Um, and March 9th, we'll hear from Headwaters Economics. Um, Megan Lawson is a leading researcher on the economics of outdoor recreation, and she will share her latest research that she has conducted in partnership with, with Legacy Partners. Next slide. Um, we have a few resources here. Um, we've got economic data. We've got why par parks and trails are important for health, brain gain. I've got a link to SCORP, core fact sheet, gateway to Glacier if you want to look at, at more about their trail systems and um, Stoltz Timber Systems, which is a great private partnership with um, Stoltz Land and Lumber that's created va creating value added product using very high tech equipment that needs talent to be able to operate it. So we, we think of, of logging and timber as maybe um, a less skilled work. Absolutely not true. Um, uh, next slide. All right, so contact. Um, I've put the email contacts here. This um, a webinar will be available as an archive look back in a, in a day or two, um, and we'll have both the slideshow and the video available. Um, you can sign up at Montana Access Project for notices about future webinars and uh, updates about uh, front country recreation. And like I said, join our Front Country Recreation Alliance. We'll put updates about this project core. We'll also put some updates on there about um, legislative updates as to what's happening at the local level and federal updates as appropriate. And um, so that's, that's what we have. So um, 
me just look. Did we answer the questions in the chat? I've been plugging away at them. Okay, good. Okay. And I think um, I think all of those, both questions and answers are available um, as part of the archive. So with that, I'm going to close up and thank all my guests immensely for um, coming on today. And um, we'll, we'll see you see on the next go round. So uh, have a good day, everyone.